Every year, thousands of experts evaluate the status of animal, plant, algae, and fungi species around the world. Using a common language of assessment, they categorize each species' risk of extinction on the IUCN Red List. The Red List provides a barometer of life. And every year, the outlook gets worse. More than 31,000 species are currently threatened with extinction. Most because of human action. But human action can also reverse the Red List trend. So conservationists, governments, and communities around the world are joining forces, activating tried and tested IUCN tools in a coordinated effort to assess, plan, and act for wildlife. Together, we can save species from extinction. Together, we can win the fight for our planet's future. Together, we can reverse the red. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to another Reverse the Red webinar. I'm Dr. Jenny Gray, and I'm joining you today from the land of the Gubi Gubi people in a place that's named after our wonderful black swans, Marichidor. I recognize 20,000 years of continuous caring for country and pay my respect to elders past and present. Reverse the Red is at such an interesting point. This week, we were awarded a Webby Award, thanks to the support and help of many of you who voted for the Reverse the Red, Red website to win this award. And we hope that this is just one of many awards for Reverse the Red. We are sharing an idea and a collaboration, really asking the tough question, the simple question of what do we need to do to solve and slow and stop the loss of biodiversity on this beautiful planet. Today is Threatened Species Day, and we're reflecting on how we can make a difference for threatened species. Today's webinar is about stories of success, of incredible stories and journeys of what we can do to save endangered species. Last year, I met a young girl. She came out to Hillsville Sanctuary. Her name is Danny. She was seven years old. She was that age where you don't have front teeth an incredibly anxious and quiet child. In fact, almost debilitated by her shyness. And her amazing mother had helped her to understand that she doesn't have to worry about everything, but she can become a warrior. And as I crouched next to this little girl, she whispered to me that she realized that while she was little and scared, there are other creatures that are smaller and more scared than she is. And she's been raising funds for mountain pygmy possums. And she handed me an envelope of money. And she had literally made speeches to help save species. She is a warrior. And today we're going to meet some more warriors, people who work tirelessly for wildlife. They will be sharing their stories of success. And in particular, where individuals and organizations have used the methodology of assessment, planning, and action to change the trajectory for a species. And while I introduce the panel who are joining us from right around the world, what I always love to see in the chat is you introduce yourselves and where you're joining us from. Um, and we also have a Menti link, which we're sharing with you. The simple question, is what is your favorite story of success? What have you been involved in? And what has led to that success? So please jump in and go to the mentee and answer that question while you're thinking about or listening to these inspiring stories. So to introduce our incredible panel for today, starting out joining us from Mozambique is Paula Bauli. Paula is an ecologist by training 
and a conservationist by practice. Her training background and experience includes marine and terrestrial ecology, community-based restoration, wildlife rescue and veterinary services. And she'll be speaking to us about the recovery of the African wild dog in central Mozambique. From Hawaii, Bryce Masodu. Bryce serves as a conservation program manager in recovering ecology for San Diego Zoo Wild Alliance, sorry, their new name. He administers the Hawaiian Endangered Bird Conservation Program and Bryce will be sharing the work on Hawaiian forest birds, particularly the Hawaiian crow. From Mexico, we have Omar Dominique. He is a senior researcher at the University of Mikondia, and I have said that completely wrong, Omar, even though you helped me. Omar has an impressive academic portfolio with research publications and student oversight. He is coordinator of several projects in the area of evolution and conservation, including the Fish Ark, a Mexico project reintroducing extinct species of fishes in central Mexico. And he'll be talking about the tequila split, split fin. And then finally, joining us also from Hawaii is Dr. Mary Hagendon. Doing that again. Sorry, Mary, as well. Um, Mary received her PhD in marine biology um, and is a senior research scientist at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. She's worked in aquatic ecosystems around the world from the Amazon to Africa, and we'll be talking about coral restoration. What an absolutely incredible panel, and I'm sure you're going to all welcome them with us today. And we're gonna start out with Paula, starting in Mozambique. And Paula, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce the African Wild Dog Project and to share with us the story of what we do, you are doing in Mozambique. Thank you so much, Jenny, and for the introduction and hello to everyone from Mozambique, which is in Southern Africa. Uh, before transitioning to a wonderful short film highlighting the recovery of Gorongosa's wild dogs, or otherwise known as painted wolves, I want to take a couple of minutes to really set the context for the ecosystem restoration that has taken place across this landscape. Uh, the bigger picture of the reverse the red work we are undertaking. The restoration of Gorongosa is a long-term multi-decade initiative and it's taking place under the leadership of the government of Mozambique and the Carr Foundation. And a key ingredient to the success of the work achieved to date is really collaborating and partnering with donors and institutions from across the world. And that includes Mozambique itself, South Africa, Ireland, the UK, Portugal, Norway, the United States, among others. And the core principle at the heart of all the work being done here is one that recognizes the rights and, and dignity of all life. But with that being said, the majority of the work we actually do is focused on humans themselves. Uh, that approach of putting sustainable and equitable human systems on the conservation radar really front and foremost is simply essential to the survival of a place like Gorongosa, the ecosystem. Uh, this is an unfenced wilderness. There are no hard boundaries. It's a highly biodiverse area. It's home to a range of large mammals, lions, elephants, painted wolves, but it's also home to a couple of hundred thousand human beings and human beings who in decades past have had to fight for their independence from colonial powers and then had to endure another couple of decades of a pretty devastating civil war with the ensuing poverty, the dire poverty that settled in. So, you know, towards achieving this very cute bundle of pups that you see over my shoulder here and, and what they represent for restoration of this wilderness, um, the wheels were really set in motion already a few decades ago in terms of assessing planning and, and now acting. And it, it took place across, across a range of programs, 
that included uh, human development programs that provide access to healthcare, clean water, schools, education for tens of thousands of people, but most especially those most vulnerable, like women, children, girls. Sustainable development programs that are laser focused on post-war rebuilding of local economies, um, and for here, that means systems of cashew, coffee production, honey production, sustainable forestry, and ecotourism. And then the science and wildlife research programs that really underpin the data-driven strategies and management actions. And media programs that take the stories of our conservation challenges and solutions and successes to people listening in across the world. Um, there are specialist teams at work every single day at the interface of the national park and communities uh, working to ensure coexistence, peaceful coexistence with lions and elephants and other wildlife. There are also wildlife rangers that are from the communities themselves and they, they work every day to secure the landscape from threats from the outside, which include mining, deforestation, uh, commercial bushmeat trade. So I mentioned all of this uh, really towards recognition of the mountain of work that really it takes to walk a species back from that precipice of extinction. And in the case of the painted wolf wild dog recovery, we've worked very closely alongside a very key partner, the Endangered Wildlife Trust, which is a South African NGO. Um, and, and that's specifically focused on what uh, we'll just highlight now in this really cool little video that we'll roll. And I just wanted to provide that context in a nutshell. Um, and uh, yeah, let's roll the film and I'm happy to take questions after. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paula. What a great video. And those cubs are super cute. Now, Bryce, your challenge is to make everyone realize that crows are super cute as well. Um, and you're going to share with us the story of the recovery of the Hawaiian crow. Yeah, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, but Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for having me here today. Uh, you know, I'm just so excited to share this story about the alala. And, you know, it's a story of collaboration, it's innovation and inspiration about one of the rarest birds in the world. 
you know, I think a lot are just so charismatic and unique. You know, they're naturally proficient tool users. Uh, they have a diverse vocal repertoire and they disperse native seeds. So really they're building their own forest home. Uh, they're the last remaining corvid species found here in Hawaii. And most importantly, alala are an integral part of the people and lands of Hawaii. So if alala thrive, then we all thrive. And over the past few decades, this, there's been a large collaborative effort here that has followed the spirit of this assess, plan, and act model to help the alala thrive. So the first step, of course, in the reverse the red model is to assess, right? We're assessing the conservation status and challenges of the species. So, uh, you know, over 100 years ago, alala were relatively abundant on Hawaii Island. Uh, but since then, the population declined. And by the 1940s, alala had uh, disappeared entirely from low elevation areas. And as, as a result, it was one of the first species to be listed as endangered in the United States under the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1967. Uh, there are intensive field surveys done in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, which confirmed that the population had indeed rapidly declined and its range had significantly contracted. And this dramatic population decline was due to habitat loss, exotic diseases, uh, and predation by introduced mammals. So the, the next step in the reverse red model, of course, is to plan. And you know, in the 1980s and 1990s, comprehensive and formal reviews for the ALA law were conducted by the state of Hawaii, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences. And as a result of these plans and assessments, the ALA recovery team was established in 1992. And this is a, was a diverse team of you know, stakeholders from state and federal agencies, universities, private landowners, nonprofit organizations, and zoological institutions. And this team frequently evaluated the changing situation of the ALA law and planned and, and made conservation recommendations. And today this team has grown and it's evolved into uh, multiple collaborative groups, which is fantastic. Um, but you know, while all of this planning was ongoing back in the 1990s, the Alala population continued to decline until it reached a low point of fewer than 20 individuals alive. So really it was on the brink of extinction. Um, and then the final step, of course, is to act, right? To implement conservation actions. So from 1993 to 1997, we conducted a rear and release or a head starting effort for the Alala. And this effort consisted of collecting eggs from wild nests and hand feeding those nestlings, uh, which would be released later. Uh, however, the wild population continued to decline. And so as a last resort, we started an intensive conservation breeding program in 1996. And since then, we've cared for Alala at two facilities here in Hawaii, and that's the Keoho and the Maui Bird Conservation Centers. And our first priorities were to increase the population size and retain whatever genetic diversity was left. Um, but, you know, conservation breeding has been challenging because all of our, our intelligent, they're complex and they have really distinct personalities. But while all of the conservation breeding was ongoing, other partners have been restoring the forest habitat in anticipation of future reintroductions. You know, sadly though, despite all of these conservation actions, Alala went extinct in the wild in 2002. But fortunately, conservation breeding saved Alala from total extinction and increased the population from fewer than 20 individuals alive in the 1990s to a peak of over 140 birds a few years ago. And as a result, we recently started reintroducing Alala back into the wild, which has been a significant milestone and, and really a big success for species recovery. Uh, so, you know, to wrap up, I'd like to commend uh, so many dedicated and passionate partners who have played uh, key roles in this monumental effort over the years. It's really been a, a community wide effort. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you. What an inspiring story. Yeah, we all want to applaud, and I'm sure you, you've got that from the audience as well. Omar, 
you've got the challenge of, of introducing us to the aquatic world and the conservation story of, of how to help save fish. Yeah, it's a, it's a fish uh, that live in uh, central Mexico in a very small area and was endemic for that area. And now we, we reintroduce the species with a great success. So I think if we can have Omar's presentation, perfect. In 1999, a group of enthusiastic aquarists established the fish art project in the Aquatic Biology Laboratory of Mexico's Michoacan University with support from Chester Zoo. The principal aim was to establish a city population of all 41 species of goddess fish, most of which were critically endangered, and some of which are now considered extinct in the wild. My name is Omar Dominguez. I'm a professor in Michoacan University, and I'm the coordinator of the Fish Art Project and Sogoneticus tequila reintroduction program. Sogoneticus tequila had become extinct in the wild several years before informal description in 1998, but exit to population remained in zoos and aquariums in other countries. In the year 2000, the English aquarist Ivan Dibu brought 20 individuals of this species back to Mexico after 20 years in exile. These specimens were donated by Chester Zoo. In 2012, Fossil Scandinavia, Afonsil, and Netherlands supported the construction of a soil pond into which 80 specimens of Sogoneticus tequila were released. In the pond, they were exposed to semi wild conditions, having to adapt to the presence of parasites, changes in water parameters, predators feeding their own food, and so on. This population will eventually grow to around 10,000 individuals, providing valuable insights into the species feeding ecology, reproductive biology, and the virulence of parasites. In 2014, we planned the Sogoneticus tequila reintroduction project to be conducted in several phases followed by the USM fuel lines for reintroduction and other conservation translocations. The first on-site phase was to study the environmental and ecological condition of the natural habitat and to choose the release site. We conducted studies into the diversity and population of zooplankton, phytoplankton, invertebrates, fish and parasites that live in the area, as well as water and habitat quality studies. With this information, coupled with findings from the semi-captive population, we were able to hypothesize about the possible interactions, both positive and negative, with the biotic and abiotic conditions of Teuchitlans, and to identify the location with the most suitable linological and ecological characteristics for reintroduction. We also found that exotic species, mainly the two spotted levy berries, the Teuchitlans bimaculatus, will have a negative impact on new Sogoneticus tequila population. Having chosen the area for reintroduction, we began to remove exotic fish and to build traps to prevent the return. We removed parasites from the individuals to be released in order to prevent their reintroduction into the habitat. The pre-release experiments were done into five four meters cubic net cage that were used as a mesocost. After initial high mortality rates, the surviving fish demonstrate the ability to feed, grow, and reproduce. During this phase, we continued to carry out field surveys focusing on limnological characteristics, diversity, and population studies of zooplankton, phytoplankton, invertebrates, fish, and parasite communities, and their potential interaction with the new population of Sogoneticus tequila. We decided to begin the full release on November 1st, 2016. This is the date of the day, a very important day for Mexican people, when it is traditional belief that loved ones who have departed on the afterlife will return to spend the night with their living relatives. Reintroducing Sogoneticus tequila on the day of the death was a highly symbolic act, with a beloved species that had died out years before returning from extinction. The fair introduction consisted of 80 individuals all market. After two months, only 36 of these could be found. Six months later, we encountered 114 and half of the females encountered were pregnant. 55% of the fish were on market, indicating that successful reproduction was already underway. Over the next three years, we conducted a complete monitoring program of the reintroduction population and its habitat. We found that the population initially grew quickly, but eventually began to stabilize. Now we are conducting capture-recapture methods to try to determine the size of the reproduced population. We have also started work on the reintroduction project of other extinct species from the area, Schiffia francese, and hope to have the same success as with Sogoneticus tequila. One of the most important tasks in conservation and in natural science is the transfer of knowledge and ideas to society, so that the benefits of sustainable development and conservation can be enjoyed more widely. During the six years of this conservation project, we have developed local capacity to secure the long-term conservation of the Tuchitlan River and the native fish species that live there. Now government, society, and local rangers have become a part of this conservation initiative and are working hard to reverse the red in all sense.
Thank you, Omar. What a, a wonderful story as well. And just really sharing the complexity and, and all. And, and we'll definitely talk about the things that have led to those successes. Um, Mary, you're closing off these first introductory comments and bringing us the wonderful world of corals. Can you, can you see my screen? Excellent. It was a, an incredible pleasure to be here today. Thank you for inviting me in. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers um, and um, all the people who've helped with this work. So my work is a little bit different than um, the other work that we've seen so far today in that we're talking about sort of a many multiple species and sort of an ecosystem. I'm gonna be talking to you today about coral uh, and, and the, um, the intense threats that are happening to coral. Um, let's see, can't seem to advance my slides here. Let's see, right, okay. So just to, as everyone else has said, we don't do this conservation world in a, we're working in a vacuum. And part of this is from my lab, but then many of my collaborators around the world will be sharing this, who's sharing this with me today. And I'm sure as everyone knows that coral reefs around the world are some of the oldest and most diverse ecosystems on the planet, but in every ecosystem, they, they are under, under siege and they are being threatened by our actions on the planet. Um, local and global stressors are impacting reefs and bleaching, which is what you see here in the lower right-hand corner is becoming more frequent across the globe, which is impacting reproduction and health. And if corals cannot reproduce, they cannot adapt to new conditions. Many spe species are threatened. 50% of the Great Barrier Reef has died since 1985 and 95% of, of reef building coral in the Caribbean have vanished. And that's just an example of some of the few species of the few ecosystems that are under siege. And so one of the things that we, we tried to do was to do what um, many people around the world are doing for their families, and that is to develop a fertility clinic for coral. And we started out by freezing sperm, and this is just an exemplar here, and we developed all our own um, techniques, we've developed all our own equipment, and we actually apply the techniques. To date, um, we have uh, about 48 species of sperm globally that we have prior preserved and have in global banks. And, and Dr. Gray, for you, the Great Barrier Reef, we have 26. Um, uh, but it's, it's across the world, and our, our, our methods are, can be used on all coral species for their sperm to date. In addition, we can make coral babies. Um, and here's one that's been made with fresh sperm, i uh, sorry, frozen sperm and fresh eggs. And um, we also can now freeze the coral coral larvae. And this is, this is um, following the tra trajectory that was done for humans. First, we did sperm, and then we were able to do human embryos, and then human eggs. But this is now we can do coral larvae. And we use very sophisticated techniques to both freeze them and warm them that include lasers. And as I said, because reproduction is being impacted, um, we are um, trying to freeze small little fragments of coral. This is about the size of your thumbnail. And we've just recently had some, some good success with that. That is proof of concept that we can do this, but this would allow us to, to go and to start collecting individuals and biodiversity um, without having to work, worry about reproduction. Coral only reproduce once a year for a very short period of time. And generally we only have a few hours um, a year to work on a particular species in terms of their sperm or their eggs. And finally, um, I'm, we're, the Smithsonian is convening a, a group of um, global international um, uh, group to, that are trying to bring all 1,000 species of coral into captivity, and uh, we, we have some uh, good start at that. So, um, I, if I, if you would, I ro roll the the movie. Thank you. Coral are a fundamental ecosystem in our oceans. We really need to save them. They're really critical for life on Earth. My name is Mary Hagedorn, and I work on coral conservation and preservation. We've been applying human reproductive techniques, like freezing sperm, to coral, and it allows you to preserve those cells for a year or hundreds of years. We are gonna thaw sperm that's been in our banks for over 10 years and use them on fresh curacao eggs to create embryos that wouldn't occur normally in the wild. For this particular species of coral, which is elkhorn coral, there's a western population 
which is like Florida. There's a mixed population. And then there's an eastern population, which is here in Curacao. If the corals do fertilize, then we have a whole new tool for coral restoration, which is the ability to bring different genotypes from one region to another. And that's what the goal is here, is to help diversify the population and to give us cues as to whether those newly made, newly created reproductive organisms are going to be better at adapting for the future. Around the Caribbean, we've lost something like 98% of this coral species. And in Florida, it's even worse than that because we're finding that there aren't very many genetically distinct individuals. They're one of the most important species in the Caribbean because of the structure and the shape they make. Also because they protect shorelines from waves, they create habitat for fish to hide underneath. And they're also powerful species because when they do break apart, they can attach back to the reef and make more colonies. This species has bundles of eggs mixed with sperm and it holds them in its mouth. And then we know in the next 10 or 20 or 30 minutes that they're going to release them all at the same time. We have all sorts of nets and contraptions that we use to collect the eggs once they're released from the colony. Then we have to get back to shore. That gets transported into the laboratory. We'll clean the eggs very well, and then we'll begin adding sperm. And if it all goes great, the eggs go from one to two to four cells and start dividing and forming the larva. We will put them into water bottles, and we'll transport them to Miami. And our partners, Florida Aquarium and Moat Marine Lab, will meet us there. Our world of babies! <laughs> and they'll begin the process of settling those larvae. This is it. Here's all of our coral babies. They're all doing fantastic. I was super scared when I first got these things that they were going to be so totally different that they, they wouldn't work out. But thankfully, I was wrong. They're extremely healthy. They're growing extremely rapidly. We couldn't ask for a better result than what we're seeing right here. This is amazing. It really is. Calling out a win. Absolutely. <laughs> There's a lot of work that went into these little guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to get to this place today, it's taken us 15 years. It's super important that we make really robust banks to conserve the genetics in as good a state as we can. This not only can work, but it can work in the kind of numbers that can be an assistance for restoration. Thank you so much. Uh, Mary, I don't know how you did it, but you had coral babies. You even made them look super cute. <laughs> uh, so such amazing stories from all four of you. And I, I'm going to ask, starting with you, Bryce, the, this, how do you think the success comes about? There's lots of people listening who may be starting out, who be, may be on this journey with us and getting frustrated. If you had to pick a few things that really led to the success, Bryce, what would you be the, the, the key things that you would highlight for everyone? Yeah, I think, you know, um, one of the things that comes to mind has come up already, and that's just been collaborations and partnerships yeah. and alliances, right? You know, for the Avala, they have really played a key role in the success of the recovery effort. You know, it's been such a significant milestone um, to save the Alala from extinction and increase the population from, you know, fewer than 20 birds alive to over 140 alive a few years ago. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, there's been restoring the forest habitat, right? That's a key component. And that's been an impressive accomplishment as well and allowed us to begin releasing Alala back into the wild. So we've really been able to do a lot more by collaborating and you know, I think everyone who's part of the effort contributes in various ways. You know, we have, again, landowners restoring the forest habitat. We have the state and federal governments, you know, committing long term to, to the Alala's recovery. And even local school children growing seedlings of native plants, you know, for the Alala to eventually eat, eat fruits from. 
And it's just been, I think, so inspirational to be working alongside uh, so many dedicated and passionate members of our community to save a species. Yeah, brilliant. You're, you're absolutely right, Bryce, that those alliances. Mary, what would you lay the success? What, what would you add to that? So clearly alliances, but what else would you be attributing the success to? You know, I can't agree um, enough with Bryce because, I, you know, I think we worked alone in our lab and we're just, you know, sort of working by ourselves. But as soon as we brought in partners and really, um, I'm going to give you a shout out to Australia, uh, Taronga Zoo was an, an amazing first partner for us where we started the bank in Australia and we created one of the largest wildlife banks in Australia because of those partnerships, because of that desire to save the Great Barrier Reef. And so it was this bringing out partners and just engaging them and, and um, you know, also training people in the science um, that really, I think it just, it's, it, it's, it's leading it to explode around the world, which is really what we want. We don't want to be alone on, you know, doing this by ourselves. And clearly technology was a huge part of what you've been doing as well, just creating new ways of, of really coming up with innovative solutions as well. Yes, but I, you know, the technology itself and, and really the, the, the the, the conservation is only as important as people make it, right? So if it, it's not an, an ethic for them and they don't care about it, it, it means nothing. And so I, I'm so grateful to all my partners um, and, and their, their, their continued desire to help. Paola, I'm sure you're going to say almost the same thing, but <laughs> any other key for success in your project? Um, yeah, I think I meant, uh, I agree completely with everything that's been said. I think some of the most important alliances and partnerships that we can forge, is, especially here in Gorongosa, has been with local communities. Um, they are the people living with wildlife here, again, in an unfenced wilderness. And uh, next generations, so again, of Mozambicans who are, we're taking the long view when it comes to doing this restoration. So I think one of the most inspiring things I've experienced in my time here is seeing these next generations of Mozambicans, scientists, wildlife veterinarians, wildlife managers, specialists in all, all the many facets of conservation here really rising out of you know, those, the shadow of the civil war and really creating something quite amazing. So yeah. <laughs> And you're clearly also doing quite a lot of monitoring. I see there's collars on the dogs. So, you know, you don't just release animals and hope they're going to be okay. You're doing monitoring work as well. Right. So when we look at the, the species conservation cycle of assess and plan and act, I don't see it as a, as a linear process. It's really circular, you know. Uh, so when we do fly in with those, those packs of, of wild dogs, and put them in their new homes, the work doesn't end there. In fact, I didn't have time in my introduction, but we have a young team of Mozambicans, uh, Dr. Paulo Antonio, Dr. Marcia Angela, Dr. Elias Mobobo, who lead the day-to-day -day monitoring of this population. And uh, literally, I think we've lost track of maybe two or three dogs out of 120 that we have over three years. And that's remarkable. We really have our pulse on, on the population recovery process. And every bit of data that, that that team brings in goes back into that assess, plan, act cycle. So that's been really critical. Yeah. And, and Omar, I'm going to bring you in. Clearly, the planning phase was a really big part of the success of what you've been doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I also agree with the, with the previous panelists and of, of course, um, to, to have the time to follow the access plan and act model and also to structure in the relate into the distinct phases was a key factor to have the time to do it. And I think one very important uh, thing was the passion of the, for the project and for FISH that they was on, and is shared by all the collaborators, uh, several researchers, students, local people and sponsors that uh, was a key factor for success. And of course, uh, one of the most um, nice things in this process uh, was to see the local people and the young people to have the same passion for after eight years of work uh, for the project and for the fish that live in the area. 
Yeah, and such great com communications as well, choosing important days to do the releases and get the community engaged in interesting ways. Now, we asked everyone at the beginning about their favorite stories of success, and I'm going to ask that the team just share what you were putting up so we can see the answers to the mentee. And as they do that, I'm going to also ask the panel, I mean, it, it looks great when we show a video and it all looks like happiness and lots of easy wins, but of course there were challenges as well. And, and so starting with you, Mary, the challenges that you've overcome, I mean, you don't get to be at this level of success without some real tenacity. What do you think is the biggest challenges you've run into? Um, I think I, that one of the biggest challenges I've and, and still really run into is this idea that um, using ex situ conservation is important for conservation of corals. And I think, you know, in the zoo community, we've understood it for many, many years that, you know, or even in the seed community that we should, we should think about ex situ conservation and banking, but in the coral community it has been, it has been really resisted. And so the um, importance of the work and, and sort of um, uh, has been sort of, uh, not highlighted by many by many groups and it's been difficult to raise funds as a result of that it's not now but I, when we first started out it was extremely difficult and i almost had to stop my work uh, for lack of funds so i'm i'm extremely um grateful to all my funders for for supporting this work even when they they didn't understand quite where it was going so i'm i'm grateful for that yeah, Mary, what, what a challenge, isn't it, to, to break down some of the prejudices and to see that we need almost every single tool we can get our hands on. That's exactly um, Bryce, the challenges that you faced as, as you were running through your project. Yeah, I think, you know, speaking of in situ and ex situ, like you're saying, Mary, you know, one of the challenging aspects we've experienced is that we've never had a manual or a textbook, so to speak, for exactly how to best conduct conservation breeding for all Allah. You know, we were the first program to really intensively conduct conservation breeding for this species. And, you know, we, we try to utilize, of course, the one plan approach as best we can by integrating in situ and ex situ activities. But, you know, the wild population information from the wild population uh, was pretty limited before the wild population went extinct. So, you know, like we're talking about, it, it's difficult, of course, to, you know, assess, plan, and act with, with a lack of basic ecological information, right? Um, but, you know, we did the best we could with the information we had available and, of course, use techniques from other programs as well. And most importantly, we've always been adapting and innovating as we go along. Um, you know, so, for example, we recently figured out that Alala in more spatially isolated aviaries uh, we're more likely to, to produce fertile eggs under our care. And so that's in comparison to, you know, the Alala and Avery's in closer proximity. So we now, you know, care for Alala uh, that are higher priority, so to speak, in more isolated aviaries. And so I think it's this combination of, you know, innovating and using the one plan approach as best we can uh, that has been important to try to overcome some of these challenges. Yeah, you're so, so right that the first time we work with a species is the first time and there's there's often no guideline and you're under huge pressure. Omar, I'm sure with fish that was a challenge as well, but you probably have some other novel challenges that came up for your program. Yes, um, I think it was very difficult uh, to convince people that are not charismatic species because this species is not really charismatic uh, group of fishes um, that has only exist in aquarium for more than 24 years, was capable to survive and repopulate its natural habitat. So feeling support, not, not only economically, but also from government people, media, students, researchers, and so on, was a hard process. But, uh, but at the end, um, we, have, uh, we were able to build a very enthusiastic and committed support network of people and organizations who help in the process. And in this, in this case, uh, it's important, uh, for example, the Michigan University that uh, at the end uh, hold the Fisher project, several zoos, as Chester Zoo, Ostrava, Willem, and Bebal Zoo, how the Merck's Aquatora Zoo, the Mohammed Bin Zayen, uh, Species Conservation Fund, some organization of aquarists, uh, as Posilia, Scandinavia, Posilia, Netherlands, the Missouri Aquarium, German, British, and Libre American Library Associations, the Weather Working Group, and the European Union of Aquarium Curators, 
uh, some local local um, group like uh, Biodiverso or or other local uh, the government and the Mexican Commission for the Knowledge and Use for of Biodiversity were very important people that uh, they believe in this project and at the end we have a, a good success and so that was the, I think the, the world the most difficult part to to find all the support in all the way for a a small fish that live in a small part of Mexico. Yeah, thank you. And and Paula, from your side, any unique, I'm sure, challenges from where you were working? Um, yeah, you mentioned tenacity. <laughs> That's definitely a, a much needed uh, ingredient. But um, stepping back to, to sort of the big picture and, and the long view, long time view, um, it really took some work to get the ecosystem primed, uh, really ready to receive, welcome back the species which had been wiped out after the civil war. And so that took a couple of decades of really uh, prepare, preparation. And that preparation included forging those alliances and partnerships and bringing the community on board with the restoration project. So I mentioned we, we have a team of 300 wildlife rangers. These are rangers from the community born and raised in this area who help secure the landscape so that when you do bring packs of painted wolves into the system, they thrive, they're safe, they're secure. Um, and, and there's another element to restoration of, of a predator, um, of course, they get a, a, a bad rap in the world. Um, but and the more time you spend with them, the more you, you learn just what an incredible species this is. Um, but the human wildlife coexistence as the coexistence aspect is critical when you're re uh, recovering a, a large carnivore, uh, wild dog, lions, leopards, hyena. You have to work really closely on that part of community interface to ensure that you don't have that conflict, that there's understanding, um, that there's a, a responsibility from for these animals from communities. So for example, we have kids that come out from the eco clubs and before we release these wild dogs into the park, they, we have naming ceremonies. We do similarly with uh, our lion cubs that are born into the park every year. Traditional leaders, uh, the, the regulados, they get to name the new cubs that are born in the park. And so there's that uh, connection that's forged. Uh, they, they come into the family, so to speak. And, and that's a challenge that we really, um, yeah, we focus very strongly on more and more as large carnivals recover in the landscape. Thank you. What, what really important insights. And thank you everyone who filled in the Mentimeter on your stories of success. Um, it really is a celebration today for Threatened Species Day to see so many names there. What you'll see on our Reverse the Red website is that we are highlighting and profiling these stories of success, and we definitely want to grow that database. So we'll be reaching out. I saw there were desert wolf spiders. I want to read that story. That's something I want to know more about. So for my panel, I'm also going to ask you, there, there's going to be a number of young conservationists. We know a lot of people access these videos afterwards. What is your best advice really quickly in terms of if you were talking to a youngster or a young field uh, conservationist starting out, what would be your best advice, Omar? What would you, or well, what do you tell them to do? Yes, um, don't, do not give up and do not get discouraged. Uh, we spent around 12 years waiting for a start this project and at the end we do it and, and, and I think with great success. So fight to preserve what you love and always remember that Small actions are helping uh, to reverse the red globally and ne never lost your passion and courage uh, for you, for what you are fighting to preserve. And I think it's the most important thing to do it and, and never, never, uh, never lost your, your, your way for do it. Yeah, great advice. Paula, what's your advice? I agree with, with Omar completely. I, I think my advice would be to really um, to 
to follow your passion. I mean, I think this is a, 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 a calling more than a career or, a, you know, conservation is, is, a, is a very personal journey for all of us. And we do it because we're very passionate, right? So each one of us has to find that place in the world where we can make a positive difference. It's, it will be different for everyone, but if you focus on finding that passion, stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> and every day is a joy. And I'm sure, Mary, your advice to young people when you get to dive amongst magnificent corals, that was a good choice of your passion. What would be your advice? I think Omar and Paolo, you know, said amazing things already, um, passion and tenacity, but also I think communication is perhaps one of the biggest things. And it's actually one of the things we fumbled on uh, for, our, for our project when we wanted to put out these um, assisted gene flow corals. Uh, we really hadn't, we didn't know it was going to be successful. And then we hadn't engaged the community sufficiently. And so our stakeholders weren't with us. And so our, our, you know, assisted gene flow corals sit in captivity while we now do that, you know, that piece. And so communication stakeholders and just engaging um, the population is so, so critical. And, and it's so much a part of the, the groups that um, you heard of today. And it's one that we are now developing on the back end and we should have been do doing in peril. I think that's just such a great point, Mary, that there's so many diverse stakeholders and there's been some questions about environmental agencies. Obviously, they're critically important as well. And so you really have to think about how you bring everyone involved and help everyone share that success. Yes. Um, Bryce, what's your advice to people out there if they want to have a conservation success? Yeah, I really like what Paula and Omar and Mary has been saying already. And, you know, I think like, like they're saying um, to remind ourselves, of course, that conservation is difficult and, you know, we have to be persistent, of course, but also it's good to celebrate our successes along the way, right? Just like what we're doing today. Um, you know, uh, like, for example, for Alala, we know conservation has been difficult. There's, there's no magic bullet, right, for, for all of these species that we work with and take care of. Everything takes time and effort. You know, Alala were extinct in the wild for 14 years before we, we were able to begin our reintroduction efforts. Um, but, you know, conservation is so fulfilling, right? It, it, it's a, it's, we're doing meaningful work, uh, and it's just so fantastic to hear all of these inspiring stories. Um, and it's also inspiring from our standpoint that uh, e even when we do have challenges, all of our partners and collaborators and communities are also still very committed to, to, to the effort. Uh, so yeah, I just like the idea of celebrating along the way with everyone. Thank you. What great advice and, and, and really all very good advice. And, and so much part of what we're trying to do with Reverse the Red and you know, you've all been doing for 10, 12 years. That's how you turn around a species. That's how we bring them back from extinct in the wild. It's just an incredible journey that we all go on. And, and while we talking about success, what we're also trying to do with Reverse the Red is just grow capacity. And so we're engaging in a couple of pilot countries. And if you haven't seen the last video, that's worth going back and watching and hearing about how we're trying to create more capacity to reverse the red. And, and while that is one of the things we need is capacity and sharing of these stories, um, we also will be coming together trying to create our first ever Global Species Congress where these stories become shared more widely and people get encouraged to really do the hard work. Now the time keeps going so quickly in these webinars, I could do this for, I think we'll have to do them for two hours, but um, we do try to keep them moving. And so for our last question, and I'm sorry to everyone who's been sending through some questions, we will try and I see there's been lots of people answering them as we're going. But I, I'd like to pose to the panel, if we were able to give you each the power to be all powerful, to change anything you could in the world to help species do better, and we really are unconstrained when we do this, um, what would you change? And I'm going to give you the first word, Paolo. What would you change if you were all powerful? If I was all powerful um, at this point in time, all women and girls will have, would have received an education and been able to pursue their passions and independently. 
and that we would have a more equitable and peaceful world because of that. Would be my wish. Thank you. Bryce, what would you do with all that power? Yeah, I think, you know, if every single person in our society uh, reconnects or strengthens their connection with the natural world, I think that would lead to changing the trend for a lot of these species, you know, and we're already, of course, heading in that direction, right? You know, there's been a lot of excellent efforts uh, being made to connect people with nature. Um, I know just, just a couple of months ago, there was a really informative and inspirational uh, Reverse the Red webinar about communicating, right? And, and that includes pe communicating with people who are not well connected with nature. Um, and it's just been exciting to see this movement towards a holistic approach between people and nature, you know, such as the One Health approach, for example. Um, so I think, yeah, if nature is, uh, you know, part of everyone's lives, then, you know, the species and environments and, and as people will all end up thriving together. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I would do. <laughs> uh, look, we've certainly had a, a master class in how connected we are as a planet and, and how important it is for nature and wellness that we look after health as well. Omar, I'm giving you all the power. What would you get up to? Yeah, thank you. I, I totally agree. Educate people, especially the new, the new generations, is a key factor. Education and awareness of uh, for a healthy environment are the most powerful weapon to, to achieve global conservation. In, in our case, uh, it uh, was amazing when children uh, express their concern for species and environment uh, and conservation to the adults. And it was at that time when the when the attitudes start to change and support this success is, is, is story for all local people. So the children were a very, very key uh, group of, of, of people from Teuchitlan that changed all the idea for the for the all local people around. And and was in, was amazing how people can do it when they are um, uh, they like to conserve and, and have awareness for, for healthy environment. Maybe a world that children were in charge of would be a little bit different. Um, I, it's one I would be interested in seeing. Um, Mary, if you're all powerful, what would be happening? I think I have to agree with Paolo on this one. I think that, um, you know, as the planet has more and more people in it, we, we use more resources. And we, we know that there's a good correlation between um, education of women and the reduction in, in pop population generally um, in countries. And so I, I, would, I, would, I would magic gender equity around the world and good education and an excellent ability to, um, to have finances to, to rear their families. And that would have a profound effect around the globe on not only human population, but on the, the, the animals and, and plants that we depend upon in this planet. Thank you. I, it's, it's sad that we don't have all the power, but we can each make a difference because we are all powerful in our own ways. And certainly the four of you have been incredibly powerful. You've actually changed the trajectory for a species. Um, and, and that is just an incredible action of power. And thank you for that incredible work. I'm gonna ask everyone else please to join me in just thanking our panel. It has been such a great discussion. The time has flown by um, and, and it's so inspiring to know one, we're not alone and two, we can do this. Um, we're not trying to set out to do something that's never been done before because we have these incredible examples. I'd like to thank our hosts, Smithsonian who have been so generous in hosting these webinars and making sure that we can share these stories of optimism. To the Pavilion Partners, who are the group of organizations that have funded the startup of Reverse the Red. And, and really reminding us that we have choices and we have a voice. And like our panel, so many of the people that I know are watching and out there, you can make a difference tomorrow. Um, and if you're not active in the field, find a project that you loved and support them, as Mary talked about how hard it is to get funds and to start up. Um, but it makes such a difference if you do run a huge foundation and you have millions of dollars at your discretion. Support people that are working on the ground to deliver these really tangible outcomes. 
it's Threatened Species Day and it's something, wouldn't it be nice that we never threat, had to celebrate Threatened Species Day because we'd saved all the animals. But as long as we do, I think this is the best possible way to celebrate by sharing success stories and by imagining what the future might be like if there were just more, if we could clone you all and have an entire army in a few years time working to save species. Thank you so much, especially the two of you from Hawaii. I know this was a brutal hour for you to join <laughs> us. Um, thank you for sharing these stories and thank you to being part of it. Um, and, and I look forward to sharing more stories of success as we touch base with so many of the stories that we're coming through. Thank you all. And I'll wish you a really good evening, sleep, day, whatever you've got ahead of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.